Well, I know Nancy looks uh, quite relaxed and so do I, hopefully. Um, but this has been an extraordinary day for stocks around the world. In Japan this morning, the market is down 12%. Double digits, 12%. Nancy Hosek is with Ford Asset Management, where she's been a portfolio manager for some time. Fortunately, I guess, she's been focusing on South Africa, which does look to be a little bit of a calm harbor in the storm of the moment, but we'll find out more in a moment. Who would have thought, uh, going back into the election, on the 29th of May that we'd be saying uh, just a couple of months later that it appears as though South African equities are calm relative to what's going on elsewhere in the world. I, just, just to unpack that, Amazon down 8% on Friday night, um, ASML down 8% on Friday night. They're both stocks in the business portfolio. And now a 12% plunge in Japan this morning, which anticipates even worse coming in other parts of the world. And yet South Africa, relatively speaking, uh, and a 2% decline. Nancy, you've been focusing on South Africa for a while, on South African stocks, and we're going to unpack in just a moment uh, the whole uh, relationship between the political side and the equities. But maybe just give us a bit more about your own background before we go into this. I know you did study accounting, and I know you were at Investec. Yes, um, Alec, it's, it's it's a really weird day when um, South Africa is a safe harbor and Japan's down 12. Hey, like uh, financial markets are, are a fascinating thing. Um, yeah, and I mean, I think, uh, you know, we, we can probably talk about it later, but it's it's been a very, very long bull market. And maybe these are, are some signs that, that that's starting to change um, globally. Not something that we've benefited from in South Africa, unfortunately, over the last kind of 10 years or more, I would say. Um, so there's a very interesting dynamic really shaping up here. Um, I mean, my own background is that I'm a, yeah, I'm a chartered accountant by training. Um, I used to actually did my, my, my articles at Investec Bank. And then I went to what was the old um, Investec Asset Management, now 91, for a few years. Um, and had a fantastic time in both of those businesses. Um, but I've been, been at Ford for a very long time now. I think I'm almost at the 10-year mark. Um, so, so yes, uh, I mean, I'm lucky enough to have worked kind of in the banking side and the asset management side, um, but investments is really my, my passion and love. And Ford is one of the stalwarts of the South African industry and very much a value house. Uh, was it much of a switch for you coming from 91, which sometimes likes the growth story, to a Ford where... And certainly in my in my experience, it's always been a company that you knew it was it was looking to protect your capital, it was looking to get you good bargains, and presumably this is a, a market now which you'd be flourishing in, but for you personally. Well, you know, I think that Investec Asset Management or 91 now was a fantastic place to to start my career because they had a, a bit a sort of a and they still do have a a boutique way of really managing a very big asset manager, which is that you have these sort of many different uh, portfolio managers and strategies within one house. And so when I started there, you know, you'd have growth managers, you had momentum managers, you had value managers, you had quality managers. And um, I, as a young analyst, got to learn from all of those people, some brilliant, brilliant portfolio managers in that business. And what you can see actually at uh, in 91 is the market happening before you because you've got some portfolio managers buying and some are selling at the same time. And you understand you know, those different strategies and how different people think, um, and very importantly. I think my decision to join Ford was actually really driven by the fact that, you know, people maybe sometimes perceive us as being value, but we it's because we talk a lot about protecting capital and um, being kind of rule number one for us. But I would say um, we actually are pretty agnostic for him from a style perspective. And I think because of my background at 91, and understanding that all of these different strategies can work at different times, I actually was really attracted to a place that sort of said, well, we're just here to make money. We don't really um, have a religion on how we do that. It's kind of what makes sense at the time. And I think that's that's very, very important, especially when you're an analyst. You know, if you have a look at a business and you think, well, this is a fantastic opportunity because it's a value opportunity, um, and you take it to somebody who's a momentum person and they say, well, there's no momentum. 
it's very disheartening because you kind of think, well, it's still a good opportunity. You know, does it, it, it doesn't have to fit into a into a kind of a methodology in order to make sense. And so, so, so some people sort of, I think, get the misapprehension that forwards value. We're not value. We we we're actually quite agnostic when it comes to that. But we do, we do have an overlay of risk, which is that when we don't know something, so when something's highly volatile we do tend to be cautious around those things. So for example, businesses like resource businesses, which have very volatile earnings, um, we tend to kind of approach them with a bit of uh, kind of circumspection. Um, and maybe that's sometimes where, where, we, where we sort of, you know, get that, um, that reputation from. I've been boning up again on my Warren Buffett uh, knowledge. I wrote a book about it some years ago and it went to the Berkshire AGM many times. Tell out. That's very, very much his focus. Uh, rule number one, don't lose money. Rule number two, never forget rule number one. And it's a little bit like what you've it described to us there. But I guess the, the story so much in South Africa is politics is greater than economics. And if you don't get the politics right, you can have the best investments in the country, but they're just not going to uh, turn out. How much time nowadays are you spending on understanding or trying to understand this rather a volatile political situation we have in this country. Yeah, the, the right answer to that, Alec, is way too much. <laughs> um, yeah, it, I mean, it really has become, um, an in, uh, I guess, an increasing focus of, of our investment team and, and especially um, myself, actually, over the period because there's really no point in um, doing a lot of bottom-up research and then not understanding what's driving the politics because, you know... I, a lot of times those issues really kind of, you know, overlay the fundamentals and actually not overlay the fundamentals, but the politics really do also drive the fundamentals in that many of the of the things that we're trying to to value, you know, are really derived from things that the politicians are themselves driving. So growth rates, interest rates, um, you know, all of those things um, certainly cannot ignore the politics um, when it comes to those things. So, so yes, I mean, we, especially, I, I would say, you know, as we come into big election cycles and these big market moving events, um, that is something that we really have to pay very close attention to. And I, I think what's also probably not well understood, you know, for, I think that's true for global asset managers is that, you know, they have to really understand that in South Africa, we have a much wider range of policy outcomes that South Africa has a much wider range in terms of the way that things can go here. You know, we can go from, we can, we could easily be a, you know, three to 5% growth country, and we could also be a negative three to 5% growth country. You know, these are not the range of outcomes that you might see in more developed market worlds. Temporarily, yes, in the business cycle, but, but, you know, that is, it's, the range of outcomes are very big here. And I think that's something that we've been very focused on. And so how are you reading the consequences of the 29th of May? So it's a funny thing, you know, Alec, we, oh, I would say from the outset, you know, when you look at the election results and we, we spend a lot of time at Ford um, sort of trying to understand what would, it, what would happen, um, you know, in May. And we did a lot of by-election analysis. So we take all the by-elections that happen. We try to build up what we think is happening um, on a provincial level, where the economic, where the political shifts are happening from a from a, um, a provincial level, we build build that up to to a national um, result. And I mean, I think what the by elections did show was there was a big shift happening in KZN. And I mean, prior to the MK party being started, because it's a very new entrant um, to the political sphere, a lot of those votes were actually going to the IFP. So we saw the IFP taking wards of the ANC left, right, and center. Essentially, voters in KZN were not did not want to vote for the ANC in this election. And actually, we thought that the IFP would have done much better um, in the in the national election up until the, the you know, um, MK sort of came around and started to persuade, I think, a lot of that dissenting vote um, towards the MK party. So, you know, if we had seen a much better outcome from the IFP, I think that would have been kind of good news. I think to see Many of those voters move to 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 the MK party, which is quite a radicalized party in terms of its um, sort of policy, certainly in terms of, um, you know, the people that are leading that party are huge allegations of corruption. And we know all of the things that surround Jacob Zuma. So, 
you know, looking looking at the election results, I don't think it's overly great news, to be honest, you know, that, that you've seen the ANC vote to leave the ANC to go to what would be, from a market perspective, a much worse outcome. Um, but having said that, isn't it amazing what we've ended up with? And I think we were, we were pretty cautious, you know, going into that election from, from how we were positioned. Um, but it became sort of quite increasingly clear in the two weeks that we had between the election and when parliament was convened that the DA and the ANC were going to strike a deal. And I mean, certainly a much better outcome. I think the best outcome we could have hoped for considering the election results. So I think in that time as a firm, we started, we, we, we were, we were quite offshore orientated prior to the election, just to protect against some of those really bad downside scenarios we could have seen. And um, we started to shift a little bit more into the SA Inc. assets. We bought some of the local bonds, some of the local banks. Um, and that was that was good because we have clearly seen a rally in some of those SA Inc. stocks. So I think kind of the two months post the election, we've seen, you know, SA Inc. roughly up 10%. And then the resources and the offshore stocks down kind of m- mid single digits, I would say. And that's really been the rally we've seen. But from... The looks of things to us, that's mostly been locals. It's mostly been, we had all the far, all the, all the local asset managers really at their max foreign um, allowances in terms of the Reg 28 funds. Some of the guys have bought a little bit of those balances down to buy the SA Inc. stuff. But from the looks of things to us, the relatively limited interest from the from foreigners at this point. So it's been a mild rally, but not... You know, we, we certainly don't think that we've seen a mad rush to buy SA, SA Inc. assets on the back of it. And I think that probably, you know, talks to some of the questions around the potential stability of the GNU. So it's not pent up demand that is just waiting to be unleashed. It's still questions, questions about South Africa's future, um, primarily political. 100%. Look, I think you, looking at the election results, you say, well, you know, You've got some really radical players in there and the ANC hasn't covered themselves in glory in terms of their policy decisions. So, you know, foreigners are not looking at South Africa as if, well, this is, you know, a return to the heydays yet. And I think even in terms of, you know, I I know you have France on, France Cronier on many times on business and and we, we, um, we, we chat to France a lot and think he's got, you know, incredible insights. Um, and, and I really take his points, you know, he makes the point that the ANC and the DA really have this um, a big overlap in terms of their policies, actually, when you take out, you know, all of the kind of politicking. And um, what they agree on is actually, is, 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 is there's quite an overlap in, the, in their policies. And that's really a positive and that they have different constituencies. And, and so those two factors mean that this could really be a very stable GNU. And um, he might well be right, and he often is right. I mean, what would counteract that for us is the history of the coalition of coalitions in the metros. You know, this is not the first time we've seen kind of coalition politics in South Africa. This has been playing out um, in many different metros since the 2016 local government elections. And the history around those co- coalitions is horrendous in that, you know, none of these coalitions really last very long at all. And it's been very, very disruptive. So, I mean, even if you look at the GNU, you know, I think it was a different situation, but it is part of history between, you know, the ANC, the IFP and the Nets in 1994. I mean, that lasted two years. So I think we've, we've long held the belief that we have to have some circumspection around whatever coalition happened post this election with whoever, which, with whichever party just based on history. And I think we still maintain that caution. And I think that's also reflected in what the foreigners are making of South Africa at the moment. I really hope I'm wrong, um, but but we have to be just cognizant of history, I think. Um, and, and I think the markets have passed that optimism in. optimism there is that this is the first time that the ANC and the DA have been in coalition. Now, all of those messes that we saw around the country didn't have the two of them together. So who knows? But uh, South Africa being a calm harbour in a stormy sea... Why would that be right now? Um, I think that I think it's a base effect, Alec. I think that's really the point here is that um, we we just haven't seen we've seen really if you look at South African ink assets in particular, 
I mean, just really low valuations, right? We've already got a very high cost of funding in South Africa. You know, our our real rates are somewhere between five and six percent um, in in terms of government bonds. Um, if you look at Japan, I mean, the opposite is true. They've probably got the lowest real rates in the world, um, particularly. And if you look at the U.S. market and where you've seen some of these sell-offs starting to come, I mean, the valuations are enormously high. So talking about multiples. And not only are the multiples very high, but the earnings are very high. So when we look at um, the U.S., particularly as an example, in terms of where they are in their earnings cycle, by any stretch of imagination, the earnings are very high as well. And so, you know, it's just, it's really just, in in my opinion, really a base effect in that when you're coming with very, very high expectations in terms of valuation plus earnings, and you start to get downtrends in terms of the macro data, you really got to watch out below because you're going to get a contraction in both of the earnings and the multiple. And actually then your, your, your return, your shareholder return is really impaired. And I just don't think that South African stocks are in the same stratosphere as what we've seen in the global markets because we haven't benefited from the same growth earning cycle and valuations uplift and interest rate um, you know, benefits essentially than, than the other economies have. So we, we're just in a totally different cycle. And I think that is potentially why so- South African assets may be a place to hide here. Um, I, I would just caution it in that, you know, many people don't know this, but when you look at the JSC, the foot, the all share index, for example, about 60% of the all share index um, is earnings that are actually offshore orientated. And so, you know, when you're looking at the all share, you kind of go, well, is that South African stocks? Mm, not really. It's a mix. Um, and, you know, I would include the resources in that because resources don't really, are not really indexed to South African GDP. You know, they're indexed to commodity prices, which are global prices, and then they're indexed to the RAND. So, um, the rand, the rand dollar exchange. So they kind of have their own metric, their own kind of drivers, if I can put it that way. So you've also got to be cautious because we do have some stocks in our universe. Richmond would be an example where if you do see a very big slowdown in global spending, um, recessionary type environments, these are stocks that don't do well. So, you know, I think there's still risks in the South African market for sure, but um, but from an overall perspective, um. Uh, you know, we're very bottomed out. Mm-hmm. So it's almost like we are at a level that is hasn't overvalued in the same way as many stocks around the world. But it, putting all of that together, the political issues, what's going on in the rest of the world, how are you positioning yourself right now? And I, I say this because you consult to a number of the Ford portfolios, so you'll be giving inputs pretty much all over the place as well as running your own portfolios. Uh, how how would you be looking? ahead from the cards that you've been dealt today yeah look this is um this is something we were discussing internally now in our meeting you know we've in our offshore in our offshore funds particularly our sort of balanced and flexible funds offshore and um, our sort of multi-asset funds and um, we have actually we, we've sort of really underperformed the last two years on 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 the you know S&P making new highs, we haven't been involved in all of these very kind of lofty stock markets, and that's really hurt us. Um, and we've actually been taking out quite a lot of protection, downside protection, so puts on the stock market in some of those portfolios, which has sort of been the wrong call as they've all gone to new highs. But I think, you know, the reasoning behind it has really been what I was just um, what I was just mentioning, where you've got very high in your earnings cycle, very high in your P.E., as a portfolio manager, you start to become very cautious in those environments. Um, and sometimes these things are just timing, you know, so you've always got to sort of try and figure out, remain humble and think, well, am I wrong or is my timing wrong? Um, because often, you know, you, um, you you capitulate just at the wrong time. Um, but I do think that some of those strategies really now will bear fruit. Um, and I think this is a time where you do want to be quite cautious of you know, global equity markets. When I say global equity markets, there are some markets that are much more expensive than others. So for example, we think China is actually very cheap. Um, We've got, you know, many businesses that we cover in China and we've got many Mandarin speakers actually in our offshore office. Um, I, for example, cover Tencent. I think Tencent's still very, very good value at, you know, at its current valuation. That's, this is a business that can still grow earnings substantially over the next three to four years um, and is actually pretty cheap. So, 
you know, if I compare Tencent, for example, to what we're seeing on the US market, I mean, that is really a market I'd be very cautious of because, the, you know, it really is the poster child for what I was talking about, very high in your earnings cycle, very high multiples. Um, and that economy has just been unbelievably strong. I mean, if you look at, you know, the unemployment rates relative to the, to, to sorry, uh, job openings relative to unemployed people, as an example, you know, how many people are there to actually fill jobs? I mean, we haven't seen metrics. I mean, this has been the tightest labor market in the U.S. sort of ever. I mean, even if you compare it to the 1970s. So these are, you know, extreme signals that the, the U.S. economy has been incredibly hot. Um, and when you are at those extremes, I think that's that's really the time to be very cautious from a portfolio manager perspective. You know, if you if you add a eight out of ten, that's one thing. If you add a twelve out of ten, that's another thing. And 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 you start worrying really about permanent capital loss in that you know in the in the forthcoming years. So. Um, so, I, I mean, the good news is that we don't actually think that global markets are that expensive, and South Africa is an example of that. Often we get these economic cycles where everything goes together. So all of the markets are, are, are high at the same time. Emerging markets are expensive at the same time as developed markets. It hasn't quite been the case in this cycle. So there are still places to hide, and we, and we think that's actually not a bad environment for us to be in um, as, as managers. So take a deep breath. Let the... Let the noise carry on around you. Just stay away from those extremely expensive stocks in the United States. And tomorrow the sun will shine again. Nancy Hossack is portfolio 100. manager. <laughs> portfolio Thank you so much for having me, Alec. With uh, Forward Asset Management, and I'm Alec Hogg from Business.com. <laughs>